My name is Amar Jyot Singh and my job is to read immigration cases. Uh, you are seeing one case that I selected uh, for you to uh, know and get benefit from. Uh, it's called Adams versus Canada. And the date and the citation number, file number, everything is listed on the screen. So if you are interested, you can do a Google search and read the case on your own in detail. But I will also give you a link down below. The reason I'm presenting this case to you because many people, they do not understand the value and the procedure of sending immigration information to IRCC. Whenever you have to send some information to immigration, uh, especially the uh, through the online, maybe web form or through email or some other way, we do not keep sufficient uh, evidence or track record of how we are sending this information and by which if the immigration in future tells you that we did not get your information and we are thereby denying your application, you have no evidence. So this is a case which uh, definitely has uh, taught me a lot and I'm sure it will be of benefit to many of you because you can repeat, uh, you, know, uh, you know, you can, you can uh, sorry, not repeat, not repeat. You can avoid uh, repeating this mistake and uh, you know, uh, try to get some benefit out of it. Uh, so what happens in this case, I'll try to keep it short. Uh, the applicant comes from Barbados. Let me just scroll down to show uh, where that is. Uh, here, Carl Anderson Adams. Uh, so uh, uh, he comes from Barbados, he comes to Canada, and then in, uh, in time he gets married to a Canadian citizen. He files for application for PR. Uh, when the application of PR is filed, uh, this was filed in 1st July 2017, it's right here on my notes. And then uh, after two years, more than two years, in December of 2019, he gets a PFL procedure for fairness letter, uh, procedure fairness letter, uh, and uh, asking them, look, uh, please explain your, uh, your criminal history. There's a possibility that you may be uh, you know, inadmissible for something convictions in Barbados from 2001 and 2004. He was given 30 days to give a reply or to apply for an individual rehabilitation. And uh, this was uh, till from, uh, till he had time till January 7, 2020 to respond. All right. So on last day, according to the client, on last day, January 6, he sent an email to IRCC asking for more time and uh, understanding very well that he had only one day left uh, before that, that time limit. Uh, and uh, IRCC, according to IRCC, which we'll see, they never received the email and thereby his application was denied after 15 days. On January 22nd, 2020, the applicant was deemed inadmissible uh, because no rehab application was filed within that 30 days given and uh, but the applicant said he filed it and you know he is like he said she said we do not know who uh, who actually did this but uh, the app the message was never received so let's jump to the case uh, on the i'll go uh, run through the paragraphs uh, quickly so this is para par number six on january 6 2020 the day of deadline under the pfl the applicant sent an email to IRCC asking for leniency and reconsideration of the application in view of the lapse of time. All right, so it, it uh, you know, it's very clear. Let me just uh, make it just slightly screen bigger if I can. Yeah, the screen is slightly bigger, okay. All right, so this is para number six and uh, look at Number nine, the respondent disputes that any extension letter was received by RC and has submitted an affidavit. The immigration uh, later on uh, in the judicial review submitted an affidavit from the operations manager of IRCC. The IRIA affidavit uh, stating that the search of general inbox was made, but no email was received. Uh, and that's uh, number nine. So uh, number 10 is, of course, the applicant, uh, they want to decide whether the applicant was denied procedural fairness. And, you know, this gives you a little uh, information about previous cases. I will jump ahead. Uh, let's see. And look at number 15. The respondent asserts that applicant has not met his burden to establish that extension request was, was before the officer. That's good. Okay, they, they have to say uh, what they found. And uh, look at this. Uh, 
Paragraph number nine, the burden lies with the applicant to demonstrate that the document was before the decision maker. If the decision maker did not have that document or the message uh, that was supposedly sent one day before or four days before, so the decision maker could not have made a decision uh, with, with that because he never, never received it. Uh, all right, so para number 20, the affidavit uh, was submitted by the applicant which states that the extension request letter was sent as an attachment by, e uh, by email on January 2nd, in fact, four days before. Uh, uh, the affidavit attaches as an exhibit a printout from the spouse Gmail account showing an unlabeled message from January 2nd at 8.42, all right, that's fine. But look at, uh, look at 21. Uh, unlike other correspondence sent by the applicant, there are no identifiers on the email to indicate what message is about or what, uh, what is pertaining to as an active IRCC file. And there was no content. That is, that is surprising because if it is such an important message, there's no content within the email that you are showing me now that, look, I sent you this message. But the printout shows only that the message has a document attachment the document is not labeled with the identifier. It appears on the printout as document five only. So come on, uh, you, you better have more, more than just a uh, document five. I mean, there's nothing to, uh, nothing to elaborate. All right, so uh, look at 23, para 23. Sometimes when you send, this, you send these emails to the official email of the IRCC or even the visa officer, sometimes you get an auto responder that there's a re read receipt. Uh, in this case, he had no read receipt and there's no printout from the email box to show that there was no bounce back. Sometimes if the email address is wrong, it bounces back. So you know that you know it, it turned it back. So uh, there was no bounce back and there was no confirmation of read receipt. So we do not know whether it actually hit the, the inbox or not. All right, so the affidavit does not speak to the issue. The, the applicant did not mention, uh, did not explain why was there not a, read receipt or, or maybe, you know, like a, like a bounce back to show that you actually tried to send it. Uh, so that's, that's what it is. But, you know, if you look at, uh, there's, there was another thing about, uh, uh, look at 27. So uh, supposedly the first email was sent on January 6th in the second email in Jan, uh, January 2nd and the second was in January 6th. Uh, supposedly, uh, on January 6th email, uh, he did not mention anything to do uh, with, with the previous email. That means, you know, there was no mention of whether he actually sent something on January 2nd. If it's such an important uh, email uh, and, you know, how come there was no mention of his previous, uh, you know, attempt on January 2nd. So that's also a little baffling and confusing why he didn't do that. And look at number 28. There's no evidence that the applicant did any follow-up as to status of a pending re extension request either before or after the decision. So some follow-up from the applicant would have been expected in the circumstances, particularly where the extension was of such importance and no response to request was received. So ultimately, uh, look at the conclusion, uh, you know, on para 31, the application is dismissed and of course, um, you know, this is what happens when there's, there's no proof. The, the name of the lawyers and everything uh, is right here, uh, the judge and you know everything is right here. So you can do a search on your own if you want by what you see on the screen, you can type on Google and you will see it. What did I, what did I learn from this case? What can you learn from this uh, case so that you can also avoid uh, such, a, such a catastrophic failure? Uh, number one, Every time you send a message to immigration, please keep a printout of all messages or keep at least a screenshot of what is being sent, including the attachments, including the contents of the email, number one. Number two, if, you are, if you're trying to send some attachments, sometimes the attachments are oversized or they are not in the right format. And they are uh, typically, if they are being unable to be opened by the immigration staff, they will ignore the message or they will maybe delete the file. So. Uh, you may have been attaching a very important document to show some kind of proof of marriage or proof of relationship, but uh, there's no guarantee that somebody is actually being able to view that attachment. So that's that's a very important uh, thing to imagine. Try to make it within the content of the message, not as an attachment. And when you are writing the content of the message, please say, this is the document that I'm attaching. The document has this, and you know, document talks about this, and this is the size, so that 
uh, you have approved, whether or not they receive it or not, you, at least you have approved that you are sending this. Number three, uh, why not use some, some kind of like a IRCC web form? If you do a web form, the web form typically allows you to upload documents as well. And then you can keep a screenshot of all the screens. Like, you know, when you fill up the web form, the first screen, second screen, and, and the third screen also, when they allow you to upload documents and then get a confirmation message, please keep a screenshot. At least you know that whatever time you're sending, trying to send, you fill this information so that, you know, you know somebody, can, somebody can, you know, see that, that at least you were trying to do this. In our case, there was nothing. And number four, I always uh, tell people, you know, why not do things the old fashioned way? You know, some years ago, 10 years, 15 years ago, we used to write a general letter. Why not write a, like a registered letter or a courier letter? Uh, and then, you know, keep, a, keep, a, keep the proof of the, of the receipt, uh, you know, as, 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 as an evidence. I think that would, be, that would be much better than sending all these emails without any content. So uh, we always uh, learn from new cases. And this is what we learn. Always keep uh, proof and evidence of what you're trying to do, just in case if there's a future litigation. So thank you very much for your time. I hope you get benefit by this case. And uh, if you have additional uh, comments, I would love to hear your uh, you know, comments about this case. If you have something that is bothering you, some, something that you don't uh, understand in some immigration law, you can always email me. And maybe if you have a case that you have read or that we heard, you can send it to me. I can analyze it for you and uh, so that you can understand it better. And that's, that's, how, uh, that's how people will uh, know. All right, thank you very much for your time. Uh, goodbye.